at the outset, I want to make something very clear that, look, the endeavor here is not to trivialize the suffering or the torment of anybody. What I want to do is I want to put a narrative straight, and the narrative is very important, is that does Islam actually have anything to do with these grooming gangs? Because often we hear that they are called Muslim grooming gangs. And this is exploited by people to their own ends. You know, the right wing, the far right will say, look, see, the Muslims are a problem. Now, what we would argue is that they have nothing to do with our religion. Actually, they are the furthest thing from our religion. They were accused of exploitation, abuse, plying these girls with alcohol and drugs, illicit relationships, rape, and at times even pimping. As Muslims, what we would say that every single one of these things actually is a crime within our religion. Then how can this have anything to do with our religion? But what does the religion, the deen of Islam say about abuse? The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in a narration related by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad that the call and the dua of an oppressed person, even if he is a disbeliever, it reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no veil between that person's cry and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Bukhari has related a narration that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting down and a janazah went past and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up for the janazah and the Sahaba said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, that's not the janazah of a Muslim. That's the janazah of a Jew. What are you standing up for? And the Messenger of Allah said, Alaysat nafsan, isn't that a soul as well? And we should show the dead respect. Then what about those who are alive? Zina, Allah doesn't say don't perpetrate, don't commit zina. Allah says do not even come close to zina. Meaning anything which is a means of you doing zina, touching, looking, talking, which can possibly lead you to committing to zina, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it haram. So then how can any of these things have anything to do with our religion? You know, they had the J report after this. She gave recommendations. All of them were to do with the institutes, the, the police, the, the council, the social uh, services. Not one of them were to do with race. Now, when you read the reports in the media, you think that it's only Muslims doing it. Firstly, Dr. J mentioned that it wasn't just white girls they were exploiting. They were actually exploiting Asian girls as well. But there's a taboo within the community. She says, we will never know how many Asian girls were exploited, but they were exploited because there's a taboo in the community and they will not come out and say it openly. They said, we need a national debate on Muslim grooming. La ilaha illallah. Like if it had anything to do with our religion. Now, let me tell you the statistics of the pedophiles in Rotherham. 68% were white, 24% were Asian, 8% were BME and 3% were female. Now, this is still a high proportion for the Asians, but not one news media picked up upon this report. Not one. If it's a Muslim grooming gang, then where are the Africans in the grooming gangs? If it's a Muslim problem, where are the Africans? Where are the Arabs? If Islam is the thing that propels these people, then where is the Arabs? Never have I ever seen a Christian pedophile say it's Christian pedophile, white pedophile. But you see Asian pedophiles, Muslim pedophiles. I remember reading the reports. Well, it seemed like every single pedophile in Rotherham was a Muslim. The vast majority of pedophilia is done one on one. One on one, not grooming gangs, one on one. The Crown Prosecution recorded that 80 to 90% of the paedophiles are actually white. And finally, I want to address the issue with the Muslims. The Muslim groomers. 
You ply these girls with alcohol, with drugs, you rape them, you pimp them, you have illicit relationships, and then you, the very same people, will go home to your daughters, to your sisters, to your wives, like you're some honorable individuals. And the Messenger of Allah said, I will look after the yateem and the woman, because they were the vulnerable in the community. You all heard that hadith where the Prophet وسلم, spoke about that woman. He, he said that the woman, she deprived a cat. She locked up a cat, left the cat starving until the cat died. The Prophet وسلم, that this woman is destined for the fire of Jahannam. Why did the Messenger of Allah give example of a cat? He could have given example of another human being. Why? Because the Messenger of Allah wanted to show us that if this is the dhulam that you do on a cat and Allah will give you Jahannam, then what about other human beings? And I'm not saying this, I ain't no Uncle Tom. I'm not saying this because they want us to say this. It's an obligation if we see a crime like this perpetrated against children, that we stop it or we inform the authorities.